Welcome everyone to our house. Again, it's been a while since we've uh, recorded anything and I'm glad to be back. And especially at this uh, propitious time in uh, world history. So the um, lecture this week on my thought, is this the coming of the Messiah? You know, this week on my thoughts, I'd like to examine the state that we find the world in today, especially in the Middle East. I recently presented a my thought that was titled, 2023. In this, my thought, I mentioned that nothing is an accident. That being the case, the fact that we find ourselves in the current secular year of 2023 cannot be an accident. The question is, is this the coming of the Messiah? I stated that in the Torah in the portion of Lechlecha in that previous lecture, it mentions that Avinu, Abraham, our father, was told by God Almighty to leave his land his birthplace, and his father's house, and to travel to a place where God would show him. Now the Torah relates that Abravinu was 75 years old at the time of this command. Now, after the Torah relates the ages of the earliest generations, age is rarely, rarely mentioned. So the fact that the Torah records that Abravinu was 75 years of age has a purpose. It tells us that this event would have occurred in the year 2023 of creation. It is also not a coincidence that this week we will read the same portion of Lech Lecha in the same year, 2023, in our synagogue on this Shabbat. Nor is it an accident that in last week's portion, Noah, which related the story of the generation of the flood and their sins against man and God, that the word Hamas is first introduced in the Torah. Hamas is a Hebrew word that denotes immorality, violence, oppression, cruelty, and outrage. We find it mentioned in chapter 6, verse number 11, in, in the uh, portion. 6, 11, right? That's the gematria, the numerical value of the Hebrew word Torah. Hamas stands in total opposition to the essence of Torah and its values. May Hamas share the same end as did the generation of the flood. The gematria, the numerical value of the Hebrew word Hamas, is 108, which is the same gematria as the Hebrew word Gehenna, purgatory, based on a Balaturim. May God Almighty pay there with their just reward. How are we to understand the ongoing conflict that exists between the Jews and the Arabs? The Ramban says that it is connected to Sora's harsh treatment of Hagar, which was considered actually a sin. As it states in verse 16.6, it says, and Sarah dealt harshly with her. That states that this is the reason that the Arab nations, the descendants of Yishmael, have been allowed to persecute the children of Israel. Rebbe Lezer Ashkenazi sees a proof of the Ramban's opinion based on the name Yishmael that was first mentioned by the angel to Hagar. Unknown to Avramvinu, that was the same name that he gave to his son Yishmael when he was born. The name is translated as meaning that God Almighty will hear by future tense, which alluded to the future reality that in the future, God Almighty would remember Hagar's pain and that Sarah's descendants would pay the price for her sin. You know, the Hebrew letters in the name Hagar can be rearranged to spell the Hebrew word harag, which in Hebrew means to kill, telling us that in the future, due to Sarimenu's harsh treatment of Hagar, her descendants will be allowed to harag, to kill Jews. So we are now in the fifth exile, the exile of Yishmael. It's an interesting aside that after the death of Sarah, Armavino, Abraham, our father, remarries Hagar. But now she is called Ketura, a name that is connected to the Ketoret, the sweet-smelling incense that was burnt in the temple. She bore him six sons, all of which he sent to the east. These were the founders of the Eastern religions. Well, they burn incense, but they have never, never tried to hurt Jews. In fact, we see that the Gera Kassidim spent the World War II in Shanghai. If we look around us, the stage is set not, all, not just for a major war in the Middle East, but 
Rahmanullah and God should help, this conflict could easily turn into the War of Wars. This is what the early prophets referred to as the war between Gog and Amogog. The word Magog is a word that is found in the Korean language. In Korea, the United States is referred to as Magog. It's translated as a beautiful nation. I find it very strange that the world hates us so. Anti-Semitism is alive and well, not just in the Middle East. Hate crimes against Jews are up all over the world. But the question becomes, but why? We have benefited every nation that, has, that we have resided in. Even though we are the smallest of all the nations, not even one quarter of 1% of, of world population, yet we have been awarded more Nobel Peace Prizes than any other nation or ethnic group on the planet. You know, Wikipedia states, out of the 954 individual Nobel Prize recipients between the years 1901 through 2022, at least 212 have been Jews, with at least one parent who was Jewish, which represents 22%, 22% of all the recipients, 19% in chemistry, 40% in economics, 13% in literature, 25% in physics, 26% in medicine, and 8% in peace. You would think that the world would love and embrace us, but as we witness, anti-Semitism still exists, and it is alive and well even in the world today. If you, re if you really think about it, you know, the world really doesn't hate Jews. What they hate is they hate the Jewish God. That is in addition to those who reside in his chosen place, the land of Israel. If a Jew decides that they no longer wish to be identified with the Jewish people, well, they can easily hide amongst the nations of the world, and somehow no one knows or cares. It makes a little difference. I believe that there are many Jews, especially after the Holocaust, who have walked away from Judaism and the God of the Jews. You know, we as Jews are not black. If we don't raise our hand, no one knows that we are Jewish. It is not our noses that the world hates. It is our God. If a Jew decides to no longer want to live in the land of Israel, and they do not acknowledge their religion, well, the world doesn't care about them. In fact, they are welcome anywhere and everywhere. You know, the massacre that took place in Israel on the last day of the holiday of Sukkot killed at least 1,400 Israeli men, women, and even little babies. People are calling it Israel's 9-11. Percentage-wise, those 1,400 Israelis that were massacred would be the same as if over 40,000 Americans would have been killed on 9-11. Yes, the American response was swift and decisive. But can you imagine what the response would have been if over 40,000 Americans would have died and another 100,000 would have been injured on that infamous day? The cry for vengeance would have been deafening. Jewish blood has always been cheap. Reports said that 37% of Americans back the Hamas terrorists and the Palestinians. Does God Almighty create these turmoils? Evil is not God's creation. No, it is man's doing. Evil can only exist when God turns away from us. Then, in that vacuum, evil can exist. The nation of Israel was on the brink of civil war before this conflict began. God, like any loving father, can deal with his children fighting with him, but he cannot bear to see his children fighting amongst themselves. When they do, he then lets nature take its course. You know, we've witnessed in Jewish history, for example, during the reign of Achav, one of the evil kings of Israel, when his troops went out to battle, none of his soldiers died. This occurred even though he was not a worshiper. The redeeming quality, that which protected his soldiers, was that there was peace and camaraderie amongst his people. However, during the reign of David Amel, King David, we see that his troops did suffer casualties. We read that Uri Hakiti, the husband of Bathsheba, died in battle. The nation did not live in peace and harmony with each other, and then they paid the price. So we see <clears throat> that when there is peace amongst his children, God is, so to speak, Erechapayim, long-suffering. In my lifetime, 
I've experienced many different scenarios as a child growing up in the 50s. You know, I remember crawling under my desk during the Cold War. I thought that I would never live long enough to become an adult and to have a family. My parents were both Holocaust survivors. But with all that I've experienced, the one feeling that I thought I would never, ever experience in the United States of America, a feeling of trepidation, a possible pogrom. Our ancestors were in constant fear that their Gentile neighbors would fabricate some excuse to beat, to rob, or to kill the Jews, such as the blood libels. They were the scapegoats for any and every tragedy that arose. You know, but I never thought that being a natural-born citizen and living in the United States today, that I would have to think twice about going to synagogue on the Shabbat, carrying a gun or not. The hatred that is now being expressed openly is sad. You know, but the Medrash states that God Almighty told Avram Avinu, Abraham our father, that his descendants would be scattered to all four corners of the earth, but then they would all return. Avram asked God, but why would they return from the lands that they have been exiled to? God replied, because of the hatred expressed by the Gentiles that will force them to return. You know, the charters of Iran, Hezbollah, and Hamas all state that they refuse to recognize the right of the state of Israel to exist as an independent sovereign nation and their mission their mission is to drive them into the sea. Well, they consider this a jihad, a holy war. But why? The Israelis have turned the desert into an oasis. The only time that the land of Israel was a place flowing with milk and honey was when there existed a strong Jewish presence in the land. Gaza was seceded to the Palestinians by the Israelis in the hope of creating peace in the Middle East. You know, Gaza is bordered by 25 miles of some of the most beautiful beachfront located on the Mediterranean Ocean. It was thought that if the Palestinians could make peace with their Israeli neighbors, that their standard of living, living would be at least 10 times higher than any other nation in the Middle East. The religious zealots never allowed the plan to materialize. As Gold in My Ears stated, that the violence in the Middle East will continue as long as Muslim mothers hate us more than they love their own children. There's only one reason that the state of Israel exists in the Middle East today. It's not due to the kindness of the Arab nations that surround them on all sides, nor is it due to the might of the United States. Its existence is purely miraculous. It is only due to the grace of God Almighty that they have been able to overcome all their enemies. All the wars that they fought and won have been over and above nature. The Israeli people want peace, you know, but they're looking for it in all the wrong places. The only power that can afford them lasting peace and security is God Almighty Himself. You know, a woman that I know has a son studying in Yerushalayim. She called me and she asked me if I thought that she should bring her son home. Uh, she added, before I could answer, that he was her only child. I told her a story about the Rebbe, Rebbe Nachman Menel Schneerson, of blessed memory, the previous leader of the Lubavitcher movement worldwide. It was during the Six-Day War in 1967. The Rebbe had instructed all of his followers not to leave Israel during the war. One mother approached the Rebbe with tears. She asked the Rebbe to be allowed to bring her only child home. She feared for her safety. She said, Rebbe, please that he is my only son. The Rebbe looked deeply into her eyes and said, to me, they are all only children. I said to this mother, I would tell you to let him stay. My wife would probably tell you to bring him home. I told her that danger lurks everywhere, not just in the land of Israel. You know, there's a verse that we recite in the end of Psalm 23 in Tehillim. There it states, Ach tov yudufuni kol if only goodness and kindness would pursue me all the days of my life. What Devon and King David is telling us is that in our ignorance, you know, many times we run away from goodness and kindness. So, so if we do, then we ask him to please let it overtake us. More often than not, 
when we think that we are running away from difficulties, we are in reality running towards them. You cannot outrun your destiny. I think that we need to look at the coming of the Messiah as a woman who is about to give birth. She's well aware that the birthing process will not be easy. She realizes that it will entail some pain and discomfort. However, she also knows that in the end of her ordeal, she will receive a beautiful child. The miraculous, that miraculous gift makes all the neg negatives that she experienced disappear. There is a concept in Judaism called Misa Abba Simas Labanan, that the events that occurred to our forefathers were a sign for what would happen to their descendants in the future. In the portion of Lechlecha, it relates the abduction of Sarah Imenu, Sarah our mother, by Paro, in addition to the taking of Lot as a hostage by the four kings. Avramavino, Abraham our father, goes to battle against these four kings and miraculously he is victorious. I think that this connects with our present time situation, with the surprise attack by Hamas and the abduction and rape of the hostages in Israel. We can also see a correlation to the four evil kings that exist today, Iran, Hamas, Hezbollah, and North Korea. And just as Avramavino was able, miraculously, to defeat these four kings, though he was vastly outnumbered. So too, may God Almighty bless the Israeli army, that they too should be victorious in their battle against the powers of evil that exist in the world today. Let us hope and pray that the birth of the Messiah should not take too long, nor should it be too painful. Let us pray that all of the prophecies concerning the miracles and wonders that we will all experience at the end of days should come true quickly. It should occur in the merit that we stand tall and proud that we are Jews, God's chosen people, that we view the land of Israel as a precious gift from God our Father in heaven, <clears throat> a gift that he bequeathed to our forefathers, Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, as we recite three times daily in the Amida, the standing prayer, where we beseech God Almighty as Semak David, bring the seed of David, the Messiah, quicker, the verse continues with the words, Ki Vishuasko Ki Visi Kalayon. For all the day we hope that your salvation will come. We need to believe with complete faith in the words of the prayer that we recite in the Shabbat morning prayer, Psalm 121, verse number four, Shir, shir La Malos, a song of ascent. In this prayer it states, Hine Lo Yinum Velo Yishon Shemer Yisrael, that the guardian of Israel neither slumbers nor does he sleep. God is awake. All that he is waiting for is the coal, the voice of his children. As we say in the Amida, Shema Koleinu, <clears throat> hear our voices. That is our strength. Kol Yaakov, the voice of Yaakov. That is the gift <clears throat> that was given to Yaakov Avinu when Yitzhak, his father, blessed him. It states in chapter 14, verse 14, that Avram Vinu called up all of his 318 fighting men. 318 is the gematria, the numerical value of the Hebrew word kol Yaakov, the voice of Yaakov. So let us all lift up our voices to heaven, and we can be certain that there is a Father in heaven who is listening to our prayers, and he will assist us, just as he did with our forefather, Avram Avinu. We as Jews follow the words mentioned in the Torah after each day of creation. By he era, by he boker, and it was evening, and it was morning. We believe that though we may experience darkness, difficulties in our lives from time to time, that we can that we can be certain that in the end, that there will be a light, true and complete, joy and happiness. We believe that in the end, everything will be good, and if it's not good. And it's not the end. May God Almighty bring an end to all the pain and suffering that exists in the world today, quickly. And may protect all of our brothers and sisters in Israel. May he bring comfort to the mourners and speedy recovery to those who were injured. With a special blessing for the hostages and especially the IDF. We as Jews are no longer sheep to the slaughter. Am Yisrael Chai, Mashiach now. I want to thank you for listening, and I also want to mention that we should all be a part of this 
process in Israel. Again, the Israelis are going to suffer not only with loss of life, Rahman as long God should help them, but also financially. Again, the whole country will be shut down while this is going on. And all the destruction that's with that with rains. If at all possible, you should reach into your pocket and try to help the Israelis in their time of need. Again, everything that you do for them, again, is a great mitzvah, helping our brother in Israel. Again, it should, we should not divorce ourselves from this. We should feel like it's family, and it is. Again, we all have 7.5 million brothers and sisters that reside in Israel. And it's our duty. It's our responsibility to help them in their time of need. Again, God should bless you and yours with all that is good. Again, we wait with, with great enthusiasm the coming of Mashiach. May you come quickly. God bless. Be well. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for listening.